On that note, okay, so, um, well, hello everybody. We're very happy to have uh, Ken Van Tilburg, who's just started a joint position at NYU and the Flatiron Institute. And he's gonna be telling us about uh, stellar basins of gravitationally bound particles. So, um, Ken. Well, thank you, Robert, and everyone for inviting me. It's good to be back. <laughs> as usual or seeing familiar faces so so i'll talk about stellar basins of gravitationally bound particles so that was a, a preprint that appeared in june and that i should get around to publishing um and then um where basically i pointed out that um axions coupled to electrons can be produced in the sun uh and also in, on gravitationally bound orbits uh, and so if you look at this animation, uh, those gravitationally bound particles can accumulate over time uh, and sort of stick around and, uh, you know, be important for uh, direct detection at late times. And then in follow-up work with Robert, um, we worked out many, many more of the specifics and in particular the case of uh, dark photons for which the dynamics and this effect of these of this bound state population uh, is much more dramatic over a larger mass range uh, and also for smaller couplings. Uh, and then also with Robert in a first year graduate student at NYU, Cara Giovanetti, um, we're trying to answer one of the uh, main unanswered questions uh, in, the, in these first two papers, uh, which is how this uh, solar basin evolves in time. Um, so that's one of the, you'll see that's one of the things that has an order of magnitude and certainty. Um, and then uh, with uh, Jin Wu Huang and with uh, another uh, NYU graduate student, Chalma Wixman, who I think is here, um, we're uh, starting uh, data analyses to do indirect detection of, of this population of particles. Okay, so just as a quick primer on how stars can emit uh, particles. So the sun emits light or photons, uh, but it does so inefficiently. So it only emits from the surface, uh, not the entire volume, and also the surface is cool. So it's actually a very inefficient photon emitter. Um, the sun can also emit neutrinos from its core, both from fusion and from thermal brenstrahlung, for example. Um, and for the sun, thermal brainstorming is not important, but it is for, oh, I, I seem to have lost my mouse. Okay. Uh, it is more important for uh, more extreme stars like neutron stars and white dwarfs. In particular, um, the first 100,000 years of a neutron star's life, it cools mainly, it, it cools through neutrinos, not through light. Um, despite the tiny coupling of neutrinos and it's just because of the long mean free path. So uh, given that stars can cool via neutrinos, they can also cool via axions or other weakly coupled particles. Um, and so that sets pretty strong constraints. So an absence of anomalous cooling of, of red giants, horizontal branch stars, neutron stars, and white dwarfs sets pretty good couplings on, uh, pretty good constraints on all the couplings of, of axions and particles. Uh, stronger, usually stronger uh, than cooling constraints from the sun, with a few exceptions. Um, but despite that, we can try to do something else around the sun, which is try to detect axions produced in, in the sun with, let's say, detectors in Italy. Um, okay. And of course, these particles could also be dark matter, they're weakly coupled. They have efficient production mechanisms and motivated production mechanisms in the early universe. So they could be dark matter and we could detect a dark matter population if it's there. So the new idea was to, to detect uh, the, frac the, the fraction of particles that's emitted into bound orbits. So at any one time, the luminosity in unbound flux is much higher than the bound flux. Uh, except the unbound flux makes one pass through Earth and the bound uh, the bound particles stick around and accumulate over time. Uh, and I'll show later that they can come to dominate the local density at Earth. So that's sort of the 
pictorial idea. Any questions about this so far? Just feel free to interrupt me at any time. Okay. So just um, to summarize what types of couplings I'll, I'll be talking about. So the first paper and in the first part of the talk, just for illustration, I'll, I'll just talk about the coupling of an axion to electrons through the pseudoscalar coupling. You could in principle do it for also for scalar particles or, or for uh, vector particles. And in the end, I'll, I'll talk about um, the dark photon case. So for the coupling to electrons, the main production mechanisms are Bremsstrahlung of electron nucleon scattering and uh, with associated production of an axion or photo production, where basically a photon converts to an axion um, from, from an, an electron line. Uh, you could also look at um, photon production either through Primakov production. Um, and yeah, that's the main process. Or, um, yeah, and if, if you have that, you also need to worry about uh, decays of the axion. And even if, even if the uh, anomaly uh, with the U1 electromagnetism is zero, you still have to worry occasionally about this dimension seven operator. Um, which it basically goes like box A times FF dual that leads to um, a decay rate that goes like the mass to the seventh power. Okay. And so in the second half of the talk, I'll, uh, I'll um, discuss the case that we worked out with Robert, um, which is uh, the case of the dark photon for which the same processes occur. Um, so it, and, and the one difference being, uh, well, the two differences being that decay is much slower and that uh, medium uh, dependence makes it such that the enhancement, that the production is much enhanced in the sun relative to other stars. Um, okay, so, um, so, so first I'll do the case of axions coupled to electrons. So um, the Lagrangian is, is written on the top left there um, with the coupling normalized um, as such so with the green box there. So, so, so the, the coupling is sometimes normalized as one over FA, but here I've, I've normalized with the electron mass. So in this dimensionless coupling GAE, uh, it's roughly constrained to four times 10 to the minus 13 from uh, anomalous cooling or absence thereof of red giants and uh, a little bit better about three times 10 to the minus 13 from white dwarf cooling. So that's this unbound flux that that uh, would normally cool um, those extreme stars. Uh, and then on the right is a spectrum of axions. So a differential spectrum is a function of energy uh, for massless axions um, from the sun. So there you see the main production process is what's labeled FF. So that's the free free uh, contribution of Bremsstrahlung. So basically free uh, free electron scattering alpha nuclei. And then Compton gives a, the main contribution at higher energies, uh, but in terms of total um, luminosity is smaller. There's also bound contributions like the FB free bound and, and BB, the bound bound contributions uh, that are subdominant, but, but still somewhat important. And in this work, I've not computed the free bound and bound bound contributions uh, as we'll see later on. Yeah. Uh, Ken? Yeah. What's contributing to these resonance peaks that you see in the free bound plus bound bound? Yeah, so th these are basic, these are coming from the fact that you can't really treat the electrons as free, right? So that they're not, um, especially in the outer layers of, I mean, yeah. The, the, the presence of the atoms is important. So, so you can have uh, processes where an incoming electron is free, and then the outgoing electron in the Bremsstrahlung process is effectively bound to the atom. Um, and at certain energies, you know, where the where the final state energy is close to a bound state energy, you you get an enhancement in the cross section. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, and so that's that's sort of complicated and, and requires detailed chemical composition of the sun, and I've not done that in, in the later work for the bound state um, mission. But, but roughly that gives a 30% con 
additional contribution to the total flux. So you should take my, you should probably add about 30% to the numbers that I have on average. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, so, so it, in this plot, this is a massless spectrum on the right for the sun. Um, but so what happens now if the axion is mass? Uh, so, so here I'm plotting the same thing. So, so Q is the energy loss rate um, per unit volume, and then uh, differentially here with energy. So um, this differential spectrum rises as a function of energy just from phase space considerations. Uh, and then for energies above the temperature of the star, you start to get Boltzmann suppression. So the dashed line would be a spectrum, let's say, if the mass was zero, if the, but if the mass is not zero, um, you, you get a little bit less emission. So that's now the, the black line. And a small fraction of the luminosity, basically that, that blue sliver is emitted into bound orbits. And so here I exaggerated greatly the uh, blue sliver. So, so just for, um, just a, a number to keep in mind, the escape velocity at the core of the sun, which is the relevant quantity, uh, is about 10 to the minus three, a, a few times 10 to the minus three. So, so the fraction emitted into bound orbits is extremely small. It's of order V escape um, cubed or less. Um, so it's a tiny fraction of instantaneous luminosity. So to compute the bound state fraction, there's actually, it, it, it tends to simplify quite a bit. So in any process of, of you know, standard model particles going through standard model particles plus uh, an axion, you know, in general, you have to integrate over all incoming momenta weighted by Boltzmann distributions, et cetera, uh, integrate over all outgoing particles. But um, since I'm interested in um, low momenta uh, for, for the axion, uh, things often factorize. So in my paper, I showed basically that if you, if you write the energy loss rate per unit volume Q, um, Basically, the, there's an integral over the axion momentum k, but, but um, the axion momentum doesn't show up essentially in, in whatever is left, which I call q tilde. Um, so, so that makes the calculation quite simple in many cases. And so that also allows you to estimate very simply the bound uh, fraction of the luminosity. And so that basically the, 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 the bound fraction uh, you can estimate from this V3K integral that roughly gives you M times V escape all cubed. So you integrate up to the momenta where uh, above which uh, the particle will be unbound. And then the unbound emission, that momentum integral generally gives you um, something of order T cubed. And in, and, and in that case, it doesn't factorize, but roughly that's the parametrics you get. Um, so, so here you see that the, that the bound fraction is always suppressed by the escape cube. Okay, if you do it in more detail, um, the blue thing is what you get for the energy injection rate at uh, energy density injection rate at radius r. So you find that this bound state population uh, density falls off as one over r to the fourth um, uh, times a volume integral over the solar interior of this Q tilde function that's, that's defined on the right there, uh, weighted by the, basically the escape velocity locally at that point. And, and then in gold, I just have the formula for the unbound uh, luminosity, and that's just the usual, it's, it's the volume integral over the energy loss rate. So that integral is just luminosity into axions divided by or pi r squared, just from Gauss's law. So if you then estimate um, after some time tau, uh, what the bound to unbound energy density is at radius r, you find the expression at the bottom. Um, so you find that it's suppressed by the thing I circled in red. So as promised, it's V escape cubed, and in more detail, it's basically the escape velocity at radius r squared times the escape velocity uh, in the core um, to the first power. And then um, 
times some uh, phase space factor that's m to the fourth over t to the fourth, basically by the argument on the right over there. Um, so that's a that's a small factor. Um, that factor is about 10 to the minus 11 or 10 to the minus 12 for m equal to t for the sun. Um, but there's a huge enhancement factor, which is the which is this factor tau divided by r, and so um, if if tau is astrophysically long, so if it's of order the age of the solar system, uh, that that can overcome this suppression factor in red. So so the age of the solar system would be 10 to the nine years, and r would be eight light minutes. Um, so and and in fact, if tau is larger than a million years, the bound state density would, would, would dominate if you plug in the, the numbers for m over order t. Are there any questions about this so far? That's, that's all the physics pretty much that you need to know. So sh should I think of once, once, these, once these bosons are produced that they do not scatter at all, they remain at the energies they started off with barring gravitational Shift. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's actually the the main unanswered question that I'm going to talk about next. Uh, Thank you. So, can if if they don't scatter at all, if they never have any interactions between emission and detection, mm -hmm. why is it right to think of them as being uh, in some like classical orbit as opposed to whatever some really big hydrogen wave function or something? Um, and does this matter it, for your calculation? I, I don't think it matters for the detection process um, at all. I, I'm treating the particles as um, as uh, effectively classical states. I think it, for, for the for the direct detection and also indirect detection process, what you care about is the expectation value for the detection rate uh, mm. on average, and, and I, I don't think any sort of coherences uh, come into that. My, my my only confusion would be directionality. Like if you have, uh, if if you're in some like hydrogenic like state, then does your detector, like what direction does it see this flux coming from? If you're just doing number counting, then that's one thing. But if you're also doing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the direction, direction. So, so things that the, the phase gets basically scrambled by the planets. So scattering does occur all the time, right? Gravity is a long range force. So there's differential phase accumulation between the different particles um, and uh, yeah the, the thing is as I'll show next is that the gravitational scattering changes the phase but it doesn't change the energy of the state so it doesn't change the energy of orbits very efficiently it does so a small amount but but not um, but not very much and also I mean if you compute the overlap um, of the produced particle. I mean, you can compute it into hydrogenic states, but it'll be an extremely high occupation number state. Um, yeah, so I think a classical description could be fine. Okay, so then I will continue. So, so Hari preempted the next box, which is uh, what are, you know, how long the, is, is tau? Like, what is this lifetime tau? Um, and so tau is basically the shorter, the shortest of three uh, times, which is the absorption time, the radiative lifetime, or the gravitational lifetime from planetary interactions and orbital ejections. So you can compute that for axions. Reabsorption is essentially negligible. You'll never, the, the chance of, a, of an axion being reabsorbed in the sun is completely negligible. Um, Secondly, also for these KV axions that I'll be looking at, the lifetime is longer than the age of the universe. So radiative decays are not important, at least not in terms of um, calculating tau. So the, the critical question is the gravitational lifetime. So how long, um, excuse me, how, uh, what's, what's the rate of gravitational ejection? Um, and so for the first paper, I, I made these three ridiculous estimates uh, with roughly three orders of magnitude uncertainty, which is a very conservative um, lifetime, which is uh, basically saying after two chaotic timescales, so two Lyapunov times, uh, everything is ejected. 
so to be ultra conservative. The optimistic time is that, oops, can you still hear me? Uh, I can yeah. hear you. Okay, my, my um, Zoom feed is frozen. Can you still see me? Yep. Yes, we can. Okay. Yep, it's, it's been fine throughout. Okay, um, so the most optimistic lifetime is that uh, it's just the age of the solar system, which is 4.5 or 4.6 billion years. And then in the first paper, I had a fiducial estimate based on asteroid data that uh, we think now is way too conservative also, probably. Um, oh, I forgot to mention, so unbeknownst to me, uh, when I wrote the first paper, Hanastad and Raffeld um, pointed out this, this bound, bound state emission in, in the case of supernovae um, and then subsequent gamma ray uh, indirect detection uh, of the bound state population. And then Dilela and Zutas in 2002 or 2003 uh, considered the case of um, a bound state population around the sun although they were trying to heat up the solar corona and, and not do uh, direct detection or indirect detection of, the, of this population. Okay, so back to what, what Tau is. So there was a paper by um, Tim Weiser and his students um, that basically considered the case of, a, um, of the solar system forming in a dark matter halo and seeing uh, what fraction of that initial dark matter halo survived. And so that gives a, a rough answer. That would also give a rough answer to what tau is for, for you know, the population, uh, for the solar basin population. Um, he didn't do full and body simulations. So he basically used uh, phase-based phase diffusion dynamics that Andrew Gold uh, has in a paper from the 90s. Um, related to dark matter capture in the solar system. Um, but based on his phase space diffusion analysis, he found 31% of, of the earth crossing uh, density to survive after the age of the solar system. So indicating that tau, that the, the life, the, the eje ejection rate is about the, uh, the, inverse the inverse age of the solar system. Um, and, and the plot here shown is is the surviving phase space. So basically, uh, Jupiter crossing orbits are quickly ejected. So Jupiter crossing orbits are outside of the dashed line in this plot. So you see that it's empty there. Um, and then the, the rest of the phase space is not quite uniform. So there's some preference for the surviving orbits to, to be at moderate eccentricity and inclination. Um, I can go through this plot in more detail. It's, it's not that important. But is, is the point that, or do you then need to have an even smaller cutoff on your uh, initial velocity, right? Because if it, if it gets to Jupiter, which is less than needing escape velocity, this is not a significant correction, but. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so the, the, you can, we computed what the, ju the if, if you eject all particles with semi-major axis greater than half of Jupiter's, so those part of, so the semi-major axis is greater than half of Jupiter's, it has some chance of crossing Jupiter at some point in its future. If you cut out all of those particles, the basin energy density would be reduced by half a percent or less. So that, that's not a significant correction. And the basic idea is that those particles, um, you know, that, well, so the, the density falls off uh, quite steeply here. So, th so the main contribution to the local energy density as I'll show in a little bit, comes from particles with semi-major axis less than one AU, right? So particles, particles can, can contribute to the Earth, um, to density at Earth if their semi-major axis is greater than half an AU. And so the bulk of the contribution comes from particles between half an AU and one AU. And if you throw out all particles beyond 2.6 AU, um, that's a loss of density of half a percent. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so that's why it's the non-Jupiter crossing phase space that's the, that'll be interesting. Okay, so now this is work with uh, Kara and Robert, and so this is completely pr preliminary, but we want to answer the question, 
which to our knowledge has not been answered yet, which is what is the gravitational lifetime of a, of a test particle in the solar system? So we have some idea based on comets and asteroids, but those are very biased data for reasons I, I can get into, but I don't want to hear. Um, but I mean, and another reason is they, you know, comets and asteroids melt when they get too close to the sun, but axions don't. So um, this is a, a, a plot of a handful of particles ejected from the sun. You see, as they're ejected from the sun, they're on extremely eccentric orbits. And if you evolve forward, oops, if you evolve forward, forward their orbits wobble around um, through light of cosi oscillations, et cetera. And over time, their eccentricity uh, goes from close to one to, to being distributed, um, including some close to circular orbits. And so we're doing simulations now um, trying to track the evolution of these particles over the age of the solar system. So, so not only to, to estimate the lifetime, but also to estimate um, things like annual modulation um, in direct detection experiments, also how quickly the phase space is mixed and what the distribution is um, at the present time, and also if there's uh, any potential correlations with uh, planetary motion. Um, so that would be the one case in which physics actually cares about astrology, uh, potentially. But anyway, we, we, so far we have not found evidence of those correlations. Um, Ken, you're, you're yeah. probably aware of this work that uh, Peter did um, many years ago about mm -hmm. the gravitational trapping and watching the lifetime of those particles. I mean, it's different than ones produced in the sun, obviously. But Yeah, good, good. So that's why, so in doing the first paper, that's why I had, that's why I felt comfortable being ultra conservative with 10 to the 7 years. So. So what Annika Peter found, and also, yeah, I think she, she answered it conclusively, but even before that, there were some, there was a Scandinavian group and Andrew Gold um, trying to estimate what the dark matter capture in the solar system is. And so indeed, the typical time scale for Jupiter to capture and fill some part of the phase space at low velocity um, basically below the, the solar system escape velocity fr from dark matter capture is about 10 to the 7 years. And so, you know, capture is a time reverse process of ejection. So then you would say the ejection rate is about 10 to the 7 years also. Um, but that 10 to the 7 years is basically the phase space that is Jupiter crossing. And um, for the basin, basically the Jupiter crossing phase space, I mean, these orbits are so wide that they don't contribute to the local density. So it's the non-Jupiter crossing phase space that we're interested in. And Annika Peter did not see that phase space filled because the capture rate was so slow. So, so that's why it's not been studied yet. And so there are near Earth um, objects, basically uh, asteroids that were perturbed and are now close to Earth. Um, but they're within the ecliptic plane, um, so they are, they are, yeah, anyway, and they're also biased towards being near motion resonances because they were ejected from the asteroid belt, and many melt in the sun. And so based on asteroid data, you would say 10 to the 8 years, but again, it's biased because of the melting and, the, and just the population, initial population. Although I guess if we want to do direct detection, we do care about the ones in the ecliptic plane, <laughs> not for indirect. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just, just to add one thing there. So there was, so in one, in the first paper of Annika Peter's series, she looked at WIMPs which were captured by scattering in the sun. So that is a bit more analogous to our case in that then they do start on very eccentric orbits which intersect the sun. But the problem with that is that they scatter enough in the sun that they just very quickly sink down into the core of the sun. Right. So yeah. that's yeah, had, again. You had no data point. Unfortunately, she had no data point with zero WIMP cross section, <laughs> which would have been the, the case of our interest. Right, right. And we've, we've emailed her for her codes, but, but um, she did not want to um, share that. Understandably, like 11 year old 
uh, whatever C code or I forget what it is. Maybe Fortran is unpleasant to look at. Okay. Um, good. So um, my collaborators told me to put large preliminary thing, preliminary disclaimers on onto these plots. So, so we're doing these simulations and. Um, we're checking for basically if, if our time step is small enough. So if, if everything is converged, we're, we also had some issues with spurious ejections from, from close encounters. So we put in some softening, but that introduces some systematics that we haven't checked yet. Plus some of these simulations haven't finished yet. So that leads to some bias. Um, but with that disclaimer, uh, this is roughly, uh, the evolution of semi-major axis here plotted for particles injected between um, 0.3 AU in semi-major axis and 3 AU in semi-major axis over 100 million years. And you see some lines sort of stop and that's because those simulations have not finished yet. Um, this is a less busy plot. So here's just 50 particles. So you see <clears throat> that particles in the inner solar system, so with semi-major axis, around uh, or less than one AU, they're quite stable. And so all of them, uh, even in the previous plot, all of them with initial semi-major axis survive uh, the first 10 to the eight years after ejection, injection. Um, and so particles with semi-major axis bigger than one AU, they, they drift in energy. Uh, and we haven't ch fully checked for convergence again. Um, but some particles, including the one on the very top left, so there you see that one was ejected um, after, uh, well, even less than 10 million years in this particular case, because it was Jupiter crossing, right? The, the semi-major axis was, was 2.6 AU or bigger. And for all of the ejected particles so far, none were from the inner solar system. So all of them were initial semi-major axis bigger than 1.5 AU actually. And um, again, preliminary. So, so if you look at how the basin density evolved, so on the left, I've, um, I've separated it into current semi-major axes. So the blue curve at the bottom is the, the fractional evolution of the, the density coming from particles with semi-major axis less than 0.6 AU, and then orange is 0.8 AU, et cetera. And then um, uh, purple is the total. And so you see that the bulk of the contribution, uh, so, so purple is the total, but the bulk of the contribution comes from particles with semi-major axis less than the green line, so one AU. Um, so, and there's, there's no significant change in the, the density thus far, at least over these time scales. So, so I think we're fairly certain that the, the 10 million year time scale was way too pessimistic, but we haven't we haven't been able to integrate yet to the age of the solar system, but we should be able to soon. Tim, can you go back to the plot of the ejected guys? Yeah. So how do I understand, like, it, is, it, is it just they get unlucky one time and they go close to Jupiter or something and then they have one unlucky interaction, that's what kicks them out? Or is it that uh, these are, you know, they tend to be slowly pushed up in energy and then driven towards something that eventually kicks them out. Well, yeah, you can see for yourself here. So, um, I mean, that, that's a very good question. So for example, this purple one, the one that I got closest to, to one AU there, uh, that I one seems to be your good. pointer. Uh, well, I can't see it either. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so I mean, we don't know yet and we don't know yet. We don't know yet. There's, there's some, there's some, you know, for example, this one in, at the very start, that one was clearly a close encounter. Uh, the other ones, you know, they started from, let's say the, the, the light blue one started at 2 AU. So at semi-major axis of 2 AU, you don't cross Jupiter yet. Nevertheless, it, it's semi-major axis started increasing. So that seems to be an accumulation of energy corrections, increases. Um, leading to ejection. Now, we're not yet sure if 
those energy increases were, were due to an accumulation of numerical errors or act, actual physical ejection. We should be able to resolve physical ejections, but of course, um, you know, numerical convergence is, is an issue. Um, yeah, I guess it's very hard to tell because several of these look like they have like whatever statistically significant slow upticks. Yeah. But this is also conditioned on the fact that they eventually escape. Right. So yeah, yeah. This, so this could be this just is totally a, this random. Is a, this noise. is an unbiased yeah. random sample of the orbit so far. Okay. Um, and so I mean again, if if we run with a time step, time step that's twice as coarse as this one, we do see spurious ejections in the inner solar system, which is why I'm not confident yet about numerical convergence. But the at least the inner solar system looks stable here. And so what is the time step? Like as a function of say Jupiter's orbital time or so the time step is adaptive. What what we use is what this so this package is called rebound. It's an n-body integrator and it, it uses symplectic integrators um, for most of the simulation with this is with time steps that are um uh point zero five divided by two pi. So let's say uh, 10 to the minus two times one year. That's, that's the time step on average. Now it uses a symplectic algorithm. So it's, it's very clever, even at extremely coarse uh, time steps. The difficulty is close encounters. So if it detects a close encounter, it, it switches to an adaptive um, algorithm. So then the simulation slows down and then it uses arbitrarily small time steps. Um, sometimes it fails, though, um, with an extremely close encounter, especially with the sun. Um, so that's why we use some softening, but basically, which is smoothening out the mass distributions. But smoothening out the mass distribution seems to have some problems with the symplectic integrator. So, so we're trying to find the right balance, and I'm not sure if we have yet. Yeah. Okay. So, but in, in summary, so in the end, this, this is the total answer. Oh, um, I forgot to mention here. So on the right, I'm, I'm plotting the density evolution, but now not by uh, current semi-major axis, but by initial semi-major axis. And there you actually see that, for example, at the bottom, particles within Earth's orbit, so with, that were not initially Earth crossing, uh, become so over time. So. So they drift slightly outwards and they can start contributing also. Um, and that may counteract some of the ejections and that could be important. Um, anyway, so this is exciting work ahead. Um, but the current status is that we don't, don't yet see a significant change in the local density. Um, yeah, we're finding some, some correlations in the phase space already, but it's too early to say. Um, we, we do seem to see, um, so Robert actually found uh, that the, the density is actually somewhat enhanced in the ecliptic plane relative to the uh, average. So this is plotting the average so far at one AU. How am I doing on time? Okay, not very good. <laughs> uh, in the end, this is the uh, local axion energy density as a function of mass um, for uh, three values of tau. So um, in red, I'm plotting the uh, Compton production. In gold is the Bremsstrahlung production from the sun. And green is actually Bremsstrahlung from the earth itself. So, so within earth's core and what, it, what the density is at the surface. But that's basically subdominant. Um, and then based on these three taus, there's some band of uncertainty. And if the axion mass is close to the solar temperature, basically between one and 10 keV, then the local energy density um, can be quite high. Um, so uh, of order 10 to the minus four, the dark matter energy density, if you assume the conservative tau, but roughly 1% of the dark matter density if, if tau is close to the edge of the solar system, which, uh, I think it is in the end. Um, and on the, on the left, I, I show you the unbound fluxes um, from Compton scattering in red 
uh, Bremsstrahlung, and then the total flux, including these atomic recombination processes. So you see that the bound fraction, as, as promised, if, if tau is lar larger than a million years, the bound um, population dominates the energy density locally uh, if tau is bigger than a million years, which, which it is. Any questions about this? Okay. Um, I'm doing poorly on time, so I will skip the information that you all know. I, I assume all of you know that xenon one ton saw an excess. I don't think the excess is real, so, so let's skip over that. Um, what I do want to say is that um, if they saw, if they did see an excess, um, it would be grossly incompatible with uh, the stellar cooling constraints. So that would be um, if, if, again, as a function of axion mass and coupling, if you attribute um, the excess that xenon one ton saw uh, to an axion, uh, the coupling would be about a factor of 10 within the um, stellar cooling constraints. There, there are ways to get around it. And I think Peter, Peter and Will wrote a paper um, saying that uh, you could have some medium dependence to the mass and or the coupling that gets around these bounds. Um, but in the simplest models, this would be uh, excluded. Um, okay, but because you get a larger um, energy density for the same coupling, uh, if the mass is near a KeV, um, the, the excess or, or whatever signal could be present in, in the xenon experiment um, does set better constraints um, uh, on the axion coupling. So depending on tau, so here I have three blue curves. So the, the, the thin solid curve bounded, uh, that bounds the blue region is for tau equal to 10 million years, which is this ultra conservative one. If tau is the age of the solar system, this optimistic bound, um, then you see that uh, xenon one ton is just creeping into unexplored parameter space. Um, and the fiducial value I took uh, basically uh, half the age of the solar system. So um, yeah, and, and then the, the dashed curves um, below are uh, assuming the axion is all of the dark matter and, and then the constraints that you get there. So that's basically the direct detection story. Are there any questions about this? You can still hear me though, okay? Are, are there any prospects for future experiments, any other experiments doing better? I guess Xenon in some sense is already background limited, right? They're background limited, but um, their claim is that their, their exposure is going to improve six or seven fold. So they're going to have six tons instead of one ton. That I think, I believe they're already running or they will do so soon. And um, at least their claim is that their background is reduced, I believe by a factor of three. Um, and your signal goes as the fourth power of the coupling? It goes like the fourth power of the coupling, yes. Okay. Yeah, so, so, so it's uh, not a very rapid improvement uh, with time right. or with this exposure. Thanks. Okay, um, I'm not doing great on time, but um, we, so, so with Robert, we worked out the case of a, a dark photon. And there, if, if the dark photon is quite heavy, so if, if the dark photon is above the plasma mass, oh, sorry, I didn't update the archive number. Um, if the dark photon mass is above the uh, plasma mass in the core of the sun, uh, the story is quite similar. So th there then plasma affects uh, do not play that significant a role. However, if the mass is below um, 300 electron volts, you could have resonant production uh, in the sun, uh, and that can greatly enhance the, um, the emission. And, um, and also due to a well-known decoupling effect at low masses, the bounds from white dwarfs and red giants and horizontal branch stars decouple. Uh, so that's why uh, it's potentially interesting at uh, low masses, as you'll see. 
Um, so if you make the same plot of what the basin density is as a function of dark photon mass, uh, you can get uh, pretty spectacular results. So for fixed epsilon, the basin density is uh, equal to the blue curve, again, for three different values of tau. Uh, and that's for a fairly low epsilon that's, that's experimentally allowed everywhere. Uh, if you set epsilon equal to the uh, current bound bef before our reinterpretation, um, you could even get densities in excess of the dark matter energy density uh, and potentially as large as the um, saturation density. So for dark photons, one does need to worry about reabsorption. In fact, um, after some time, the basin saturates. So you achieve detailed balance with the sun. So the occupation number never goes above um, T over M, uh, essentially, just as, as it would for a, a Boltzmann distribution. Um, and so if you reinterpret the xenon one ton constraints on uh, dark photons, or their, their line search in terms of dark photons, um, you get, again, these blue exclusion regions. So for, for tau of 10 million years, you find the blue region. Um, if tau is indeed um, uh, the age of the solar system or close to it, uh, there would be an even larger um, uh, range of parameters excluded. Uh, so all the way from 12 EV, which is the ionization energy of xenon, uh, up to uh, several keV. And again, if you interpret, it is consistent with the excess, um, even, yeah, for, for, for basically any reasonable value of tau, uh, if you do believe the excess. And the interesting thing is that, um, or one of the interesting thing is, things is that um, small scale experiments can also set uh, interesting constraints, uh, even at very low masses where you don't necessarily have a huge exposure. So the, the dashed curve um, between one EV, I'm sorry, I can't use my pointer, but the, the dashed curve between, um, let me see if I can fix this. Nope. Well, the dashed curve between uh, one EV and- Ken, you can annotate uh, it, I think, if you want. Yeah, but it's, it's very strange, okay. Okay. I, I don't see my own cursor, so I don't know. Uh, let me not mess with this. Yeah, let's not do All that. Right. Let's just keep it going. Okay. Th and there is a pretty easy, are you using Keynote? Yeah, yeah, I know, I know what, I thought I did that. Hold on, now I'm, one second. So, sorry, I don't mean to, I guess you go to preferences. It, it, it's too late. I, 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 I know what you're saying. There, there is an option to, to change this, and I thought I did but I guess it didn't remember after an update. Okay, well, the, 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 low, the low energy constraints are set by um, CDMS. So above 1 EV, that big uh, unexplored section of parameter space that, that can be uh, de possibly detected is, is, from a, is the projection from a super CDMS. Um, any questions about the dark photon case so far? Okay, so then I will just finish with um, some other ongoing work with uh, Jun Wu Huang and Shalma Wexman, um, which is to try to indirectly detect it. I'm sorry, now I lost the slide. Oh, I did lose a slide. My apologies. I, I clicked something weird. Thanks, Ani. I, I, <laughs> Um, so, which is to indirectly detect it. Uh, so, so the, so the stellar basin can be produced around uh, any star, including the sun and white dwarfs. So if you compute um, what the energy flux is as a function of axion mass. So here, here for on the top left, I've set the electron coupling to the maximum allowed value and the photon coupling uh, to the maximum allowed value. 
And then uh, I'm showing the energy flux in units of ergs per unit second per square centimeter per steradian on the sky um, as a function of axion mass. And then the different curves are for different angles away from the sun. So if you look uh, 10 degrees away from the sun, the energy flux can be uh, quite large. So large even that that flux would uh, fry XMM Newton, uh, most likely, or at least saturate it. Um, and then the flux falls off as one over, uh, one over theta cubed uh, at small theta. And even if you look 90 degrees away from uh, 90 degrees away from the sun, or even just uh, directly away from the sun, the flux is still potentially detectable. So, so just for reference, the um, the faintest um, X-ray flux that current observatories can detect is about 10 to the minus 15 ergs per second per centimeter squared. Uh, so th that's that's the threshold for XM Newton, Chandra, um, and New Star, uh, as well as E Rosita for for point sources. It's a bit more complicated for extended sources. That's why it's a work in progress. Um, and then for white dwarfs, you could also get so, you know, despite them being farther away, the density is so high, um, and and the temperature is also quite large that 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 is a potential um, indirect detection target. So here you see again that the flux can be above um, 10 to the minus 15 or 10 to the minus 16 ergs per second per centimeter squared. Um, but just as a warning, the background is not zero, which is why um, this analysis will take some time. So in particular for the sun, uh, there's a, a, a quite a bright corona, which is, uh, which does not, I mean, which makes it so that it's not clear that looking towards the sun or away for this, from the sun is, is the better strategy. Uh, so this is something we're looking at. And then secondly, uh, many white dwarfs are quite bright in X-rays. So Sirius B, which is the case I, for which the case for which I computed the signal above, uh, you know, even though it's quite faint in optical, it's actually brighter than than what we normally call Sirius uh, in X-rays. So that's a, a Chandra image. Um, however, the the X-rays that we do see come from the surface, which is generally cooler than the core. So, so by doing a line analysis above that um, continuum emission, we can hope to uh, do a low background analysis despite the brightness of the source. Uh, but this is work in progress. Um, there, there are actually zero background targets. So some, some stars, including uh, Betelgeuse, or, so red giants and, and super giants in general, don't have are not detected in X-rays, so they don't have a corona that emits appreciably. So, uh, on the right, I'm plotting, or, or I'm showing an image from a, from a recent paper that did an X-ray um, an X-ray search on Betelgeuse. So, B Betelgeuse is is within that white disk there, and you see it's the the background is uh, is basically zero. Um, and furthermore, Betelgeuse has a core that's at least uh, two times 10 to the eight Kelvin uh, in temperature. So, um, and, and the, the emission rate, including the bound state emission rate is a, is a very steep function of temperature. So this could be um, a very exciting target. Okay, so I think I'm at the end of the hour. So um, yeah, what I'm, what are interesting future directions are indirect detection, which I just mentioned, um, mostly from decays. Uh, we haven't yet thought about conversion in a B field, but that's also potentially interesting. Um, just around the sun and many uh, compact stars, so white dwarfs, neutron stars, and red giants and super giants. Um, so, um, so the case of the hidden photon or dark photon and uh, axions coupled to electrons is already worked out. I've not yet done um, CP even scalars or or general axions coupled to photons. Uh, there's also a potentially interesting signature um, or at least process uh, for pair production of fermions. Um, but again, that's not that, that's not been done yet. 
And then thirdly, we're studying how the stellar basin evolves, in particular the uh, ejection time, but also questions about uh, reabsorption and, and what the statistical signal would be in um, direct detection. And then I've contacted at least LZ, um, and so they will do uh, a reanalysis based on their um, Lux data and hopefully their their next run for for this uh, signal, uh, which yeah, for for which we hopefully have our gravitational ejection analysis done <laughs> before that. Okay, so I'll just I'll stop here. Thanks. Okay, well, thanks very much. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, yeah. So I have a question about the uh, gravitational dynamics. Hmm. So um, from the perspective of, like, of a single particle, uh, the reason that this stellar basin idea is good for direct detection is that that particle stays in the solar system for a long time. And that gives it more opportunities to interact with detectors. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering, have you considered the possibility of gravitational capture by the Earth itself in some kind of weird, like complicated maneuver, like scattering off the moon? Um, because if, you, if it stays near the Earth, then it would seem to me that the chance of that particle interacting over time ends up being much higher. Right. Um, I think, yeah. Let me see. Uh, I think the the gravitational capture cross section um, is quite small. So if you compute, for example, the um, yeah, I th I think that that process is quite slow. If if you compute, for example, so so you, so you need to change the energy an appreciable amount, right? Mm -hmm. um, and changing the energy an appreciable amount is the same process as ejection. Ejection just means you, you change the energy by so much that it's no longer bound to the solar system. And so the rates for changing the energy in order one amount goes like um, basically an orbital time, uh, inverse orbital time. Uh, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, the, 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 the rate for, for such a process goes like the inverse orbital time times the mass of the sun squared divided by the mass of the perturber squared. Uh, and so the mass oh, other of the way, Other way around, right? The rate goes as mass oh, of the perturber. Oh, the rate, yeah, yeah, the other way around. The mass of the perturber squared divided by the mass of the sun squared, thanks. Um, yeah, so, so that's why actually we think close encounters in the solar system, even with Earth, which is much more massive than the moon, is unimportant. Um, so I, I don't think, I haven't computed it, um, but I don't think, the, the the probability of that happening for any one particle over the edge of the solar system, I think, is small for this reason. And separately, uh, for some candidates like dark photons, even if you did, the fact the Earth is at a much lower temperature means that its saturation density okay. can be very small, so it would be reabsorbed in a different part of the Earth instead. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So. So for example, this, this saturation density is basically the, um, is, is, is basically at, at low masses, it's m cubed times the temperature of the sun uh, times the escape velocity cubed. But in, in, for the, in the case of the red line, it's the escape velocity locally um, at, at the current location within the solar system. If you compute the saturation density, in the Earth basin, which is this red dot dashed curve, is it's much lower uh, because the escape velocity here is is lower, and also that I mean, in this case, it's lower because of the temperature of the Earth's core as well. Actually, on this saturation point, uh, mm -hmm. if the if the orbits circularize enough that they no longer intersect the sun, then this they, they, you can't get reabsorption, right? So you can't like this yeah, down yeah, yeah. any so, meaning. So, so how sure can you even be that this is a no good? So that's a thing. question. So, so, um, so we assume for for the okay. So for the thin red curve, we the that's the saturation line. If you don't circularize at all, or at least, or at least if you only have rapid light of cosi oscillations. Um, the the thick red curve is where you where you populate the full phase space. I mean, our our general picture is that you should 
even though the circular orbits do not cross the sun and cannot be reabsorbed, eventually the, the, the phase space mixing is rapid enough that the entire phase space builds up to the same occupation number. Um, and that's where you achieve detailed balance. But it's, it's true, only the crossing orbits will, um, can be reabsorbed. And they, they are reabsorbed on a relatively fast time. So, so circular orbits get perturbed into sun crossing orbits on a relatively short time scale, about 10 million years. Another, another way to see that is just Liouville's theorem. The maximum density of the phase space anywhere is set by whatever density you build up in the part of phase space that you actually inject in. Right, yeah. Uh, sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I had one other, I think very short question about the indirect detection stuff, which is as a detect, you know, as a discovery tool, this makes sense. But, uh, you know, in terms of placing constraints or something, how well do you have to know the solar systems of each of your indirect detection targets? Like for obviously the non sun targets, you know, Betelgeuse or something like this. Yeah. Uh, in order to make conclusions and how well are these solar systems known? So Betelgeuse is a disaster in terms of uh, knowing the internal structure because it, it's highly dependent on how close it is to core collapse. But you can make some minimal assumptions. So you can make, we know by the fact that it is a supergiant that it's burning helium in its core. So that's the minimal assumption that we can place. And I mean, the, the profiles of massive stars are well enough known that we can set constraints. We just right. don't know the internals yet. Sorry, what I meant was planets, right? If you have some planetary perturber, um, like one that's Jupiter size can be detected definitely. But if there's one that's less massive, but closer in, would that, you know, be a significant perturbation that could? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's something we need to investigate. So in fact, it may actually be helpful to have a companion because especially, especially white dwarfs, um, uh, if they suppose they do not, and most white dwarfs probably do not have a companion, at least at least not a close one. When we know this from wobbles, etc. Uh, but having a companion is good because here the emission is so large that you sat that you saturate quite quickly, and if you can only saturate the part of phase space that is Earth crossing, then you're in, in trouble, right? Like you actually want to you want some mixing so you can populate the full phase space. Um, and so, so we actually do, we, we like, uh, white dwarfs with companions. So, um, either a planetary companion or, or a stellar, uh, companion. So, so we need to select for that. Yeah. Um, I, there, there are upper limits and it, it's something we're, we're thinking about. Yeah. For the sun, of course, we know, um, Uh, yeah. Kind of separate question. I, I know you alluded to conversion in magnetic fields. Would this stuff at all be relevant to this, like Ben Softy's Magnificent Seven uh, neutron star signals? Yeah, so, so neutron stars are interesting too. Uh, we haven't done the analysis for, um, for conversion yet at all. I mean, not even the signal calculation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I don't, but, but for example, uh, Ben Safdie's analysis from last year, we can in principle directly use for in, in our case. So, so there, um, yeah, they actually found uh, above a KEV or so. So, so the neutron stars are also detected in X-rays, including the seven that Ben Safdie at all looked at. Um, but they're very, they're quite faint above a KEV. So, and again, the core is hotter than the, than the surface. So you can try to look for a line, um, you know, let's say a factor of 10 above the surface temperature. I mean, even, even at lower energies, you're looking for a line on the continuum emission, but that's harder. Uh, yeah. It, it, for the case of neutron stars, including the seven that they looked at, we really, I mean, for a neutron star, the problem of saturation is even more striking. So, and, and neutron stars are even less likely to have a companion because they went supernova. So, so in, in that case, it, I think we do need to select for ones with companions. And I don't believe the seven neutron stars, I could be wrong, but at least the closest one of those seven neutron stars do not 
have do not do not have a detected companion. Uh, can in your dark mode on uh, figure uh, no, not this right here. Uh, no, no, the one with the fluxes. Ah, this one. What is the epsilon at current limit row infinity? What what is that line correspond to? So so good. So the 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 thick the thick green line. Uh, the, the, the thick green line is the bound density if you take the current limit here. So if you take the edge of the gray region, that epsilon, uh, that, that corresponds to this green curve. Okay, so, so that's the maximum it, ah. it could have been. And then you'll notice here, right, for example, at between 300 EV and six or 700 EV, we produce, uh, you know, a, a base in energy density that could potentially be larger than the dark matter density. Um, but that corner is now excluded by, by this analysis. So, so that corner, you see, we, we, we exclude a new uh, triangular wedge, even with the super conservative um, base in lifetime. Um, so, so now the current limit has changed. Like we've set a better limit on uh, kinetic mixing, even with this conservative time. And once we feel confident about tau, we can, we can likely improve all of these bounds between 12 EB and, and uh, 5 K EB. Yep. Uh, but, but, but I was specifically interested in the, in the, I think the dashed line, which, which says, uh, Oh, that, which that's goes the, flat. that's the luminosity. That that's the unbound luminosity. Rho infinity is the energy density from the unbound luminosity. So, so this is the energy density on earth from the yeah. sun. Unbound luminosity, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so, so uh, one quick way to derive that one is that the the solar flux locally in actual photons, not dark photons, and, you know, is it kilowatt per meter per meter squared? That gives you kilowatt per meter squared is about uh, ten percent of dark matter energy density, mm -hmm. and then the the solar cooling bound on this plot corresponds to a change in solar energy total solar energy loss of 10%. So that's why oh, sure. this epsilon at current limit is about a factor of 100 below. And it's flat because the epsilon at the current limit is it keeps increasing for smaller masses, correct? Uh, say that, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, okay, okay, that makes sense. Cool, thanks. Uh, and does anyone have any other questions? Well, if not, uh, well, thanks again to Ken for a very nice talk at uh, short notice. <laughs> Thank you. If I can nice stop. Again. Yep, let me, uh, let's stop the, uh, oh, where's the thing?